Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Council's Tuesday, October 26th session. We have one proclamation today recognizing Carbon Monoxide Awareness Month. Let me turn it over to Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Council President Hucker, and I'm joined today by uh, County Executive Elrich and uh, Fire Chief Scott Goldstein. Um, I did just want to start off by uh, making sure that people understand why these proclamations are so important. Uh, a young person actually had asked me uh, about why we do proclamations, and it really is about awareness and making sure that folks understand the myriad of things that are going on in our community. And one of them is the dangers of carbon monoxide. Uh, this is something that you'll hear from uh, the fire chief uh, in a little bit is dangerous not only to individual residents, but also to those first responders who oftentimes have to go into uh, these situations to try and save someone's life. And they happen quite frequently. And that's the other thing that's quite surprising. You know, it was just in March of this past year, of this year uh, that six people were hospitalized, including some children, uh, because of a carbon monoxide leak at an apartment building right here in our county. And uh, our fire officials thought that it was due to a defective stove. Anything that burns uh, creates carbon monoxide. And so when you're burning uh, wood, when you're burning gas, all of those kinds of things, they emit uh, that carbon monoxide. And so it's really important to make sure that you have carbon monoxide detectors inside your home uh, all of the time. Now, the great thing about it is the state of Maryland has actually mandated since 2008 that builders put in carbon monoxide detectors in all houses. Um, the challenge is uh, that, of course, we have a lot of inventory here in Montgomery County and some of it's old. And so what we oftentimes see is for our more affordable housing and some of our older housing, folks don't have carbon monoxide detectors. So not only is this a safety issue, it's also an equity issue. And so we wanna make sure that we continue to raise awareness. That's what these proclamations are all about, to make sure we can impact our residents in a positive way to educate them about the dangers that are out there and what we're doing working in conjunction uh, with our departments like our fire department and others to make this happen. I wanna turn it over to the county executive because he was my co-lead sponsor uh, when I introduced this bill back in 2018 before he joined uh, being our county executive and really wanna thank him for his partnership, uh, for his support. Again, carbon monoxide is really easy to address by getting a carbon monoxide detector. Uh, they're available at every single hardware store, your Costco's and Target's and Walmart's, the whole nine. Uh, you can even find them in some grocery stores and uh, convenience stores. And so from that perspective, as we enter into the winter months, this is really the appropriate time where folks are gonna turn on their heaters. Some of them may have gas uh, uh, or, or, or fuel burning stoves, uh, uh, wood burning stoves that they use all kinds of things like that, um, whether they might be using additional uh, uh, generators that also uh, emit uh, the carbon monoxide. So it's just really important during this time of the year, especially uh, that we make sure that we uh, make, make people aware of the dangers of carbon monoxide and what we can do about it. And just a uh, shout out to the Greater Capital Area Association of Realtors, uh, who also was a great partner with us in working with this to create a bill uh, that really focused on safety of our residents. Uh, we understood that putting in place a lot of other uh, restrictions about notifications and requirements for realtors is always a challenge. However, uh, they saw the safety, they saw the importance of doing this for the greater community, and I just really want to thank them for their partnership as well. So let me turn it over to the County Executive first, followed by Fire Chief Scott Goldstein, County Executive Elrich. Yes, uh, th thank you, Craig. I, I thought, you know, putting that bill together and the work that was done with the realtors and, you know, the broader community was like really important to the excess of that. Like you said, you know, sometimes we propose regulating things. It's a difficult challenge, but everybody came together and recognized the importance. And I just want to thank you for taking the lead on that back then. It was, this is really an important piece of legislation. So as, you know, winter's approaching. It's getting kind of obvious. It'll be 35 degrees some days this week. Uh, the increased threat of carbon monoxide, which kills more people in winter months than any other time of the year. More than 400 people die in the United States. It's often dubbed the silent killer. Um, carbon monoxide is colorless and odorless, and it's impossible to detect without an alarm. 
The symptoms mimic those in many other illnesses, including nausea, headaches, dizziness, weakness, chest pain, and vomiting. But in the more severe poisoning cases, people may experience disorientation or unconsciousness or suffer long-term neurological disabilities, cardiorespiratory failure, or death. And when someone does go unconscious, the consequences come can come about very quickly because now you're not able to move or recognize that even your experience of difficulty, and that's where we get most of our deaths. Um, we uh, want people to install and test their CO alarms. If you don't have one, you should get one. They're the only way to, like I said, to detect this gas. The test alarm functions, uh, you need to test the alarm function monthly and change the batteries every time the clocks change. Um, Run kitchen vents or exhaust fans anytime the stove is in use, uh, meaning a gas stove, and the kitchen stove is among the most frequent sources of carbon monoxide in the home. Never use a gas oven for heating your home. That's a never do that to heat your home. Never use generators indoors. In case of power outages, portable electric generators must be used outside only and have fuel burning appliances inspected regularly. If a CO alarm sounds, leave the home immediately and call 911. There's no reason for people to die because of this. As long as people get these detectors, you'll be able to keep yourself and your loved ones safe. It's important, it's not expensive, and it's easy to do. So thank you. Chief Goldstein. Thank you, Councilmember Rice and County Executive Elrich, as uh, you hit so many of the critical points pertaining to the silent killer and the, the, the carbon monoxide dangers. Um, it's that blue flame, the orange flame, the yellow flame, anything that produces a visible flame inside your house, be that your fireplace, your stove, your hot water heater, your dryer, your furnace, or that produces a byproduct through combustion exhaust, like the executive outline, a generator, a car that's parked in a car, uh, a garage that's left running, that produces carbon monoxide and that does um, migrate into the structure. So all of those reasons are, are safety concerns. The simple fact of the alarm, amazing new technology is out there, multilingual alarms, alarms that you can um, select the language of English or Spanish on. Uh, as Councilmember Rice outlined, these are available almost everywhere throughout the, the home improvement as well as the convenience store uh, market. And they're now also coming with a 10-year batteries, just like the smoke alarms are, so that you have that detector ever present. They can be plug-in models where they're powered by your house current. They can be uh, batteries, or they can be nine, nine volt or double A's. They have a shelf life. They have an effective sensor life. So take out your readers, flip over to the back of the alarm and look at that small marking on the back of it, because like a smoke alarm is good for 10 years, certain carbon monoxide alarms are also good. Some of them range uh, in different ages between five and 10 years. Make sure that your alarm is, is still in a servable situation. Additionally, we have people, out, as the executive talked about, generators inside. We have people who tragically use charcoal burning devices inside. There's a barbecue grill. We've also seen uh, excess, excessive smoking um, that creates, over time, a buildup of carbon monoxide in, in uh, apartments. And carbon monoxide being neutrally buoyant will mix throughout the structure. Um, it will rise with the air and be equal concentrations at the second level as it will be on the first level or in the basement. So these alarms are most critical outside of the sleeping area to give you that early warning when you're, you're most, uh, most defenseless and when you're asleep as it called it silent killer. So Excellent work with GoCar and the, the council and the executive as this made another tool. It's been over 40 years that the county has had a smoke alarm requirement, and this just broadens the safety net of resources, keeping our residents and our community safe. So thank you both.
Sorry about that, having a little bit of technical difficulties, but thank you so much, Chief Goldstein. Uh, now, County Executive, uh, you'll join me. We'll go ahead and read the proclamation. I think you have it in front of you. Yes, I do. Okay, terrific. Well, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, whereas carbon monoxide is a colorless, odorless, poisonous gas, commonly known as the silent killer, that can be fatal for humans and animals and typically leaks from faulty, improperly used, or incorrect, incorrectly vented fuel burning appliances, such as furnaces, stoves, water heaters, fireplaces, or from generators used indoors when power outages occur after severe weather and? Whereas at least 430 people die in the United States every year as a result of accidental carbon monoxide poisoning, many of whom mistake the initial symptoms for the flu, which includes headaches, dizziness, shortness of breath, fatigue, and nausea, and? Whereas the County Council unanimously passed Bill 23-18, requiring many existing single unit, two unit, and townhouse dwellings to install carbon monoxide alarms uh, outside of sleeping areas and on every level of the home, effective July 2019, thus expanding the scope of homes required to install this life-saving device and Whereas this additional protection is a result of cross-agency collaboration and support from organizations such as Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services, Department of Permitting Services, and Housing Associations, who each have a committed unique resource, have committed unique resources to educate residents and prevent the loss of life from carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, therefore, be it resolved, Mark Elbridge as County Executive and myself as Council Member, uh, hereby proclaim Carbon Monoxide Awareness Month in Montgomery County, Maryland, and urge all residents to test their carbon monoxide detectors at least once a year and ensure their gas appliances are working properly and vented correctly. Signed the second day in November of this year, 2021, by the County Executive and myself. Thank you very much. And just last but not least, just want to make sure that if you cannot afford a carbon monoxide uh, alarm detector, uh, please reach out to our fire department. We do have resources that are available for both fire alarms as well as carbon monoxide alarms. We never want affordability to stand in the way of safety. So thank you, guys. Thank you, County thank Executive. You. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mr. President, back to you, sir. Uh, thank you all. Very important message. Uh, now, uh, my notes weren't updated, but we do have a second proclamation, very, very important one, recognizing Susan Kennedy. Uh, today is a bittersweet day for us at the Council, as we are saying goodbye to our dear colleague, Susan Kennedy, thanking her for her remarkable 30-year career serving Montgomery County. Susan has done incredible work over her tenure to relay, relay critical information to residents on COVID-19, on public policy matters, and vital public health information. You may recognize Susan as the face of cable, uh, County Cable Montgomery or as the moderator for many of the council's town halls and other virtual events. Her professionalism and her ability to, to tell compelling stories with depth and heart and honesty has made her such a pleasure to work with and will certainly leave us without a beloved member of the council family. Uh, Susan, I wish you nothing but the best in your future on behalf of all of us at the council. Thank you for all of your hard work, thanking us Thank you for making us all look good and for your commitment to the residents of Montgomery County. Um, without further ado, let me read the proclamation uh, so we can continue to embarrass you and then hear from my colleagues and you as well. The proclamation says, whereas Susan Kennedy is an Emmy award-winning public information specialist who has been reporting on Montgomery County government, non local nonprofit organizations and community members for 30 years, and during this time, she has produced countless hours of programming for County Cable Montgomery, social media, and community groups. And whereas Susan is known for her professionalism, journalistic integrity, and grace under pressure, which has earned her the trust of all who have had the opportunity to work with her across our community. And whereas throughout the year, Susan has interviewed political leaders, captains of industry, sports stars, hometown heroes, and residents, and she provides the same care, attention, and commitment to every story she tells. And whereas Susan is truly the face of County Cable Montgomery and her work has contributed to the county's transparency through her news cycle reporting, where ha which has earned her numerous awards, some of which include a Capital Emmy for her reporting on economic development, a Savvy Award for her documentary on the heroin ep epidemic, and the NATOA Awards for public health coverage. And whereas her reports have educated residents across Montgomery County about critical public policy issues and her work during the COVID pandemic to push out vital public health information 
and truly save lives. And whereas Susan is deeply committed to serving the community through her numerous volunteer efforts, including training service dogs for Warrior Canine Connection, and she was also recognized last month with the Do-Gooder Award, which is given to individuals who help to change lives, alter perceptions, and build awareness. And whereas Susan's ability to tell great stories filled with emotion, depth, and a call to action, as well as her good humor, dedication, and friendship will be deeply missed, and, and Mike will be heartbroken. Uh, now, therefore, it be resol- it, let it be resolved that the County Council of Montgomery County, Maryland, hereby thanks Susan Kennedy for her outstanding work serving the Montgomery County Council Cable, uh, County Cable Montgomery and Montgomery County residents and wishes her all the best as she begins the next chapter in her career presented on the second day of November in the year 2021, signed by myself. Congratulations, Susan. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very, very humbling, honestly. And I was thinking the other day when I first started, there were seven council members and we were just getting started with this cable channel. And there was a lot of skepticism as to the programming that we were producing as, you know, how it would come across to residents. And then I see where we are today and how we have kind of filled the gap where the news desert is here in the county. And and we try to get the information to the residents. And I think we've done a great job, especially since Sonia Healy's been at the helm. And um, I'm really, I really love my job. That's why I stayed so long. And I will miss all of you. And I thank you so much for the opportunity to stand alongside you and tell these great stories about all the wonderful things you've done for county residents. So I will miss you. Thank you very much. You bet. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And um, Susan, I don't know where to begin and where to end. Uh, quite honestly, let me, let me start with something that matters to me personally, which is my kids. Um, And both of them and their love for animals and your love for animals uh, helped. And it's funny when my daughters say, hey, um, I need to call Susan to ask her a question. And I'm just like, what's what's going on here? You know, I get daddy gets circumvented out of (laughs) the, the, the discussions, but it talks about your heart and it talks about how you reach people. And that same way in which you care for uh, our wounded warriors and veterans who have served uh is showcased in every single interaction that you have um and it's shown in your pieces and in a time in which our news media is unfortunately oftentimes very jaded uh in trying to get gotcha stories or sensationalism you tell what's happening in the community uh and you tell it with truth and conviction uh it's not jaded uh it's it's something that's there that talks about what's truly happening on the ground so that our residents know, uh, so that they can appreciate, so that they can be involved. Uh, That's what media is supposed to be all about. Uh, And so thank you for being a champion for that, uh, for continuing to tell the stories that are important about why people should trust government, should be involved and engaged in government, uh, and should continue to fight for the things that they believe in. So many of the stories that you've talked about are about individuals who've empowered themselves to make change in their own community. Not only have you uplifted them and their work, but you've also inspired others to do the same. And so I hope that you leave here understanding the great impact that you've had on those individuals and on this greater community. And we owe you a debt of gratitude for all the great work that you have done. So thank you very much, Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Albernoz. That was really well said from both of you. So not much to add, but I did have the <clears throat> opportunity to meet Susan and Mike uh, not long after I was uh, sworn in as the new director of the recreation department almost 15 years ago. And uh, I remember how nervous and anxious I was when I got that job. Uh, was a little little young under the collar, um, and I remember how awesome Susan you were with uh, just just how how warm and approachable you were. Uh, and and I was a little anxious in that interview. I still remember it. Um, but you told me to calm down and relax and that I was going to do a great job and this is a great county. Uh, and that meant a lot to me then. And I have really enjoyed your reporting. You have set the bar very high uh, here in Montgomery County in terms of both the sophistication and level of production. And as Councilmember Rice said, just being able to fully tell stories that really are important to all of us because oftentimes the more controversial issues get the most noise and attention, but it's the everyday function of county government that makes the 
deepest impact in people's lives, from festivals to nonprofit organizations that are doing great work in the community to wonderful facilities and libraries. So uh, thank you, Susan. Job well done. Uh, and I hope you are not a stranger, and I hope that we have the opportunity to cross paths again in the future. Uh, so congratulations to you and for all that you've done on behalf of Montgomery County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And you are right. This is truly a bittersweet day. Susan, you know, if anybody deserved a do-gooder award, you certainly deserved it. I mean, you put up with Mike Stringarth for all those years. I mean, <laughs> and for those of you, this is an inside joke in many cases, but Mike is quite a character. He's the He's the uh, camera person who's always with or has always been with Susan or with her for many many years and and of course he I always joke with him and he knows everybody in in, in Montgomery County and and he does um, but you know I'm gonna miss you seeing you at lunch we've had many many good conversations there um, you you remind all of us and every and I agree with what my colleagues have have said but you remind all of us that not all the news coming out of Montgomery County is bad news. There are so many good people in Montgomery County that just get overlooked because they didn't they didn't do something that that is is newsworthy supposedly. You know, I, I've often said that if you have three people walk down the street and break a window, that'll make the news. If those same three people went and fixed that window, nobody would mention it. And and we need to. That is that is not fair. For in any way, but you, amongst all the uh, the reporters, have always managed to make certain that we know about the the three people that did the right thing in those cases. So I, I'm I, I don't know who else is going to speak, but after everyone speaks, I believe that we should be giving Susan a standing ovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I agree, uh, Councilmember Friedson. <laughs> Thanks so much. I, I don't know that I've ever seen a standing ovation on Zoom, so I'm very excited to see what this looks like, and we probably need Susan good. to help us with the production value uh, so, so that everybody can, can uh, understand what it's supposed to look like. But um, I just wanted to express my own personal appreciation. Uh, Susan, you've just been such an important part of the council family, and, and you have been such a great colleague, somebody who I'm, I'm proud and honored to call a friend. And you've also, as a professional, just been such an important part of giving a voice to so many Montgomery County residents, those uh, stories that uh, people otherwise wouldn't be uh, aware of that can make them proud to live uh, in Montgomery County, to understand all the wonderful things that, that people are doing to shine a light in places that often uh, have been in the shadows. And so I just wanted to express my Appreciation for all of your work. It is truly a public service, what you have been doing. And we are grateful for your work. Uh, we're appreciative for your friendship. And we are wishing you a, a, a good journey as you move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Glass. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I didn't want to miss this opportunity from uh, one former journalist uh, to another to say thank you. Uh, and as my colleagues have all said, uh, your professionalism and your ability to help us communicate with our residents um, has been so important. And I know that you uh, love Montgomery County so much that you are staying engaged in it uh, and that you will still be communicating with the residents of Montgomery County. Uh, and, you know, I hope to see you out and about, uh, not only seeing your smiling face, uh, but seeing uh, seeing your rescue dogs uh, and uh, canine warrior dogs, which is another component um, that makes you an incredible person and human. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, we will continue seeing you and please do uh, stick around and just thank you for everything that you've been doing and for who you are. Thank you so much. Council member in Novato. Well, Susan, I was, it's, it's interesting because this is a family. And so when I saw the message, uh, it just really hit me uh, in the heart because, um, you know, you, that's who you are. I mean, you help us tell the important stories. You help us communicate with our residents. You, you did it seamlessly, even when you were doing a, 
interviews in Spanish. Uh, you were right there. It didn't skip a beat. And it's just very hard uh, to, um, to see you go. But I just want to thank you for everything that you have done. You have been exemplary. You have been extraordinarily professional. It's so creative. I mean, that's the part that I love the most about all the stories, all the videos, everything that you've ever done. And, uh, and then, you know, your compassion uh, for those beautiful dogs and the service that you provide. So thank you again. I wish you all the best. I hope that you are going to take some very important time to spend with your family and all of those wonderful things. Um, and I hope to run into you here and there and see you see more of your work as well. So thank you and best wishes to you. Thank you all so much. I will definitely miss you a lot. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this family. It means a lot. Thank you, Susan, so much. Uh, stay in close touch. We wish you all the best. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'll see you at 1.30 at the public hearings. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Don't, don't <laughs> go you. far. We're Thank counting you. on you for that. Uh, you, <laughs> you, we'll miss you for long. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Sydney, uh, Zoom will probably create a, a standing ovation emoji based on your... Uh, there you go. You should. Innovation here. <laughs> We're nothing if not innovative. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay. It's 9.30, so uh, we are right on time, and... We are now on to uh, general business. So, Madam Clerk, would you mind please sharing announcements, agenda changes, or petitions with us? Good morning, Mr. President. There are two announcements. The Council is seeking applicants for the Charter Review Commission. Application deadline is November 15, 2021 at 5 p.m. Added to the agenda... Uh, to council to general business, that is, in anticipation of the transmission of the report from the redistricting commission, the council has tentatively re has tentatively scheduled a briefing on November 9, 2021, at 2 p.m. That is all, Mr. President. Uh, thank you so much. The clerk has also distributed the minutes to council members for the meetings of September 28th and October 5th, 2021. Are there any changes? Hearing no objection. The minutes are approved as submitted. So now the council can sit as, as district council. Item 3A is the introduction of a resolution to approve use of advanced land acquisition revolving fund for acquisition of real property from Imperial Investment Company to create a South Silver Spring Urban Recreational Park. Action is tentatively scheduled for November 9th, 2021. Okay, without any questions, that is now introduced. Now we can take up the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? Councilmember Katz moves. Councilmember Glass seconds. All those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among all those present. And suddenly we're a little early. Our, our guests, uh, oh, maybe we don't have guests. Um, why don't we pause for a few minutes to let our colleagues um, catch up before we sit as the Board of Health.
Okay, Quinn, I think we can begin again. Okay, Ms. Wellens, are you with us too? <clears throat> uh, yes, Mr. President, right okay, here. Great, great. I didn't want to start without you. Um, I know uh, some colleagues will be uh, rejoining us, um, and I don't want to get too far ahead of schedule because that causes problems. Um, item 4.5 is the introduction of a resolution to adopt an amended Board of Health regulation to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and indoor mask guidance in Montgomery County. I want to turn to Ms. Wellens in just a moment. I'll just try to frame this quickly because we've had so many questions. Today, the council acting as the Board of Health is introducing an amendment to the Board of Health order that will require seven consecutive days of substantial COVID-19 transmission for the indoor mask mandate in public places to be reinstated. This amendment would help reduce confusion about our indoor masking requirement and also provides us with a clearer picture of our health trends and the status of the virus effects on our county. We all realize these changes have been confusing for residents and business owners, and we appreciate everyone for their patience and their flexibility through this evolving time. We are learning about this virus and making decisions in real time, as we have for a year and a half, following the best protective public health guidance to keep our residents safe. And as we head into the colder months with the holiday season just around the corner, we must adjust the Board of Health order, which we just uh, we last amended back in August seems like a very long time ago, to reflect changing conditions in our county and our region. Despite our county's high vaccination rates, there is still a large segment of our younger population who are not yet vaccinated, and even following the approval of the vaccine for 5 to 11-year-olds, it will take several weeks after approval to get a majority of residents in that group vaccinated. And getting to that place is critical to keeping our schools open for in-person learning without a new outbreak. Schools just reopened in September and keeping them open is a goal that we announced at the time and we all share. We also recently heard the sad news about Secretary Colin Powell. And that's a reminder that there are thousands of residents just like him, fully vaccinated, having the access to great health insurance, but still high risk and immunocompromised residents who are at risk of getting seriously ill or losing their lives to COVID. So the amendment to this order is meant to take all those factors into consideration because the Board of Health has taken a cautious approach and followed the advice of a professional public health team throughout this pandemic. We are performing better than the great majority of jurisdictions in this nation. And we are largely aligned with other jurisdictions with mass mandates, including Baltimore, Prince George's County and DC, all of which have a large number of black and brown residents who have borne the disproportionate harm from this pandemic. So the action I anticipate later today 
is in line with similar nearby jurisdictions. So I want to thank everyone who's reached out to all of our offices to share their input on this matter as we take all of your views into consideration. These are tough decisions. These are decisions that have also saved countless lives, both here and at home and across the nation uh, with a similar approach. We will be holding a public hearing later today on the amended regulation do it during our afternoon session at 1.30 p.m., and we'll vote on it and discuss it after at that time. Um, Dr. Bridgers, welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us. And Ms. Wellens, can I turn to you first to explain the amended uh, regulation? Uh, yes, good morning, and thank you, Mr. Council President and Council Members and Dr. Bridgers. Um, I am happy to provide a brief synopsis of the amended Board of Health regulation that is being introduced. Um, so, as you noted, Mr. President, um, the current regulation was adopted on August 5th, 2021, uh, just as the county was entering into a, a period of sustained substantial transmission as a result of the Delta variant. And we were also at that point ramping up for in-person school. At that time on August 5th, um, the county adopted the Board of Health regulation, and which included a masking requirement. And if the council today or the Board of Health today does chooses not to adopt the amended order, um, the existing order would be in place. And just to be clear, what would happen under the existing order is that because we are now in substantial transmission and pursuant to the notice that Dr. Bridges provided um, on October 30th as a result of the substantial transmission, we as a county would have our mask, our face covering mask requirement for indoor public places would go into effect on tomorrow, um, November 3rd, 2021 at 12.01 a.m. Then once the county um, returned to um, seven consecutive days of moderate transmission, that face covering requirement would be lifted. Again, this is under the existing regulation. Um, then if subsequent to that, the county returned to substantial transmission for any duration of time whatsoever, then the mandate would be triggered again we would go back, the mandate would go back into effect after following the notice that's required on the reg, under the regulation by the health officer. So that brings us um, fast forwarding to today, Mr. President, um, the County Council sitting as the Board of Health has introduced an amended Board of Health regulation, um, taking into account our situation today in which we have been hovering between moderate and substantial transmission and in which we are poised to begin uh, vaccinating our 5 to 11 year old children. If the amended Board of Health regulation is adopted, then the face covering requirement would not go into effect tomorrow on November 3rd at 12.01 a.m. Um, instead, we would be looking to whether there are seven consecutive days of substantial transmission starting with um, October 30th, 2021, which was our first day of, of this current period of substantial transmission. And if we have seven consecutive days, meaning that every day um, from now through the end of November 5th, 2021, that would be day seven, then the uh, masking mandate would be triggered following the advance notice of the health officer. And as Dr. Bridgers has confirmed, if that is the case, the actual effective date of the mandate would be specified in his notice and it would be November 9th, 2021 at 12.01 a.m. Again, that is if we continue to be in substantial transmission through the end of November 5th, 2021. If the period that we're in of substantial transmission that we're in does not last continuously through November 5th, then the clock under the amended regulation, the clock would be reset to zero. The mandate would not go into effect on November 9th. And then subsequent to that, if we did in the future have seven consecutive days of substantial transmission, then the mandate would be triggered. The health officer would provide advance, several days of advance notice and the notice of the health officer will specify the exact date and time 
that the mask requirement would go into effect in that case. Um, happy to try to answer any questions either now or later during your discussion, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stoddard or Dr. Bridgers, do you want to jump in here before we go to colleagues? Sure. Good morning, uh, Council uh, President Hucker and to all the esteemed Board of Health uh, assim- uh, Council members assembled today. When I look back and I reflect over the past 21 months, on uh, March the 5th, I believe, we had three cases, and our three cases were in Maryland and in Montgomery County. To date, as of this morning, when I checked the, the data from the state, we had 82,630 confirmed cases. We made significant strides, and I truly appreciate sitting from my office the respect of the science and the data that you and the council and the county leadership, Mr. Elridge, and our community have respected what we provided and what we reported to the council. Again, when I looked at the CDC map last night, almost uh, seven days ago, there was a little blip of moderate transmission in the Middle Eastern state that was Montgomery County. We know that this virus is an enigma and it has changed nine times. There are nine variants being monitored, including the mu strain, which you referenced that maybe um, uh, uh, the previous Secretary of Health, Colin Powell, had. And we know that the mu variant strain uh, impacts those um, with immunocomprom- uh, who are immunocompromised and attacks the immunity process for those who are vaccinated. We also know that the Delta virus, the Delta variant strain of the virus, um, when the original Board of Health um, regulation and order was passed, um, was done so, and, and, and that attacks and has the um, characteristics of transmitting the virus five times greater than the original alpha strain. And so we continue to monitor the data. We look at the hospitalizations. We look at the deaths. We look at the case count, the test positivity, the reproduction or R not value, as well as the characteristic of the community. And we continue to provide the data and the science. But more importantly, we also consult with our community experts, those individuals in the Medical Society of uh, Montgomery County, MedKai, and our public health advisory board, which we convene in certain instances where we would have a cadre of medical doctors, scientists, epidemiologists, and other community uh, uh, key stakeholders to inform our process because we may miss something. There may be community level trends. There may be national trends that we may not see because we're focused on a certain data set. And all of these variables and factors we've taken in consideration as we inform council sitting as the Board of Health. We appreciate the uh, support and we appreciate the uh, orders that you put in place to safeguard the community. We will continue to provide that uh, advice. And we recognize that sometimes that, you know, it, it is not a best fit, but we continue to provide the best practice and what the science and data are saying to council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. The only other addition I would make to this is, and Dr. Bridgers and I have just discussed this over the last several weeks, is as we begin to vaccinate our 5 to 11-year-olds, we think that really reflects the next major sort of milestone in our COVID-19 response. And as we begin to vaccinate 5 to 11-year-olds, hopefully later this week, uh, the, the conversation is going to begin to shift to what comes next and where 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 are our future goals related to COVID-19? What do we as a community, are we prepared to live with? Uh, the, the, the notion of there being zero COVID is something we don't we don't agree that we'll ever be zero COVID. We agree that it's going to be coming an endemic disease. And as we vaccinate more of our residents and cross, you know, barriers like our 85 percent fully vaccinated number, which we expect to reach with this population becoming on board, <clears throat> where do we begin to transition our response and our and our um, our tools and our methods? And so I think that the the, the proposed amendment to include a, a specific date in December to review the, the mask mandate and other and other conditions is an appropriate uh, addition to allow us to better understand what the goals related to COVID nineteen response and recovery are as a community and understand what measures are appropriate to reach those goals. So I appreciate that addition to as an amendment. So that's a lot this morning. Thank you both. Council member Friedson. 
Yeah, thank you. I just uh, wanted to express my appreciation to Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Stoddard, everybody who's been involved in this, Council Vice President Albernaz, Council President. Uh, there's been a lot of work over the last several days. None of this has been uh, perfect. Uh, certainly, uh, we're, we're trying our best uh, here uh, and uh, to uh, create added clarity that this Board of Health Amendment uh, does, I think, is really important to have uh, some uh, sense of uh, stability to provide a level of uh, communication uh, for the health officer and for us to make sure that the public and our residents and businesses are aware of you know, what the rules are so they can follow them. I think that we uh, all should take pride in the fact that our residents have stepped up and we've asked them to uh, make changes to their lifestyles and make sacrifices uh, and, and to adjust their behavior in order to control the spread of this virus. And we're doing better uh, than almost any other place in the country as a result of the, our residents uh, really doing that. In order to make sure that that continues, we have to make sure that we're providing clear guidance uh, to them. And I just really appreciate uh, Dr. Bridgers in particular, uh, all of the uh, collaboration uh, over the last uh, week or so to try to work through this. Uh, later today, now we're obviously not uh, taking legislative action uh, right now, I don't believe, but I, I do have two amendments that I just thought that uh, we should make folks aware. Dr. Stoddard noted uh, one of them, uh, which is uh, a termination uh, of this uh, regulation, that the regulation must terminate and must have no further force or effect, uh, effective December 31st uh, at 1159 uh, p.m. Um, uh, and in addition to that, I plan to introduce these together after uh, a, a suggestion and recommendation from Dr. Bridger's uh, there also will be a reporting requirement for uh, the health officer on or before December 16th uh, to report to the Board of Health the current COVID-19 data, including transmission rates, hospitalization rates, vaccination rates among 5 to 11-year-olds, among other uh, age groups, so we can see how that progress uh, is going, and to make any recommendations uh, as the health officer uh, deems necessary for further action by the Board, uh, by the board of Health uh, if uh, required to manage the spread of COVID-19 and to protect uh, public health. This, uh, importantly, will do what Dr. Stoddard just noted, uh, uh, but it will also provide an opportunity uh, for us to review the data after the Thanksgiving holiday, when we have some uh, time after that to look at how our progress is going uh, with uh, 5 to 11 uh, year olds and to make adjustments. If we do have to take further action moving forward, which we have no idea what this virus is going to do as uh, past has uh, proven uh, to us. Uh, we may not wanna be using the metrics that we were using uh, from uh, early August, uh, which uh, was the CDC's uh, best guidance uh, then. And so uh, this will allow us to, uh, to move forward, to have a clean uh, break on this particular uh, effort to keep our residents safe and will allow us to reassess uh, moving forward with the uh, termination at the end of the year. So I just wanna, thank the public health team and, and Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Stoddard for uh, working through that. And I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware that uh, I in, intend to put those uh, forward uh, when we take action later this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you for all your input into this and the council vice president and all our colleagues that worked on this. Council member Rice. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting feedback. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so this has been a difficult one. And the reason why it's been difficult is because we have for a very long time been doing the right thing. And the right thing has been more conservative than many people in our community would like, uh, been more conservative than surrounding jurisdictions. But the results have been positive. The results have been one that continue for us to lead the way when it comes to vaccinations, as well as uh, the lesser severe cases, hospitalizations, deaths, the whole nine yards. And so then to say that you're stepping away from the very things that actually got you to the point of being a leader uh, in this country, not just in this region, is difficult. But I do believe that there has to be a balance. And I really want to thank Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Stoddard, who talked to me over this weekend uh, and kind of guided me through uh, some of this process of thinking in terms of where we ended up right now. And while I was more comfortable with a smaller uh, sort of lead in in terms of getting back on track, because I know that every day that we have higher case counts means that more people are at risk. 
And I understand that many who don't feel as though they're at risk aren't concerned about others who may be at risk. Uh, but that's our job. That's our job as the Board of Health. And so we have a very different responsibility from the average citizen. The average citizen is thinking about themselves and their family, rightfully so. Many of them are also concerned about the community. But we actually raised our hands and put our hand on a Bible and said that we would swear to ensure the safety of all residents of Montgomery County. That means those that are marginalized, those that are uh, oftentimes in the shadows, uh, as our former county executive used to say. Um, and so it's important that folks understand that as we go about making our decisions. Um, these aren't decisions that are made in the context of, oh, how can we negatively impact someone's life? How can we keep people restricted? You know, um, while we don't respond, we, we, we see what folks write on social media. And so I'm going to respond today and just say that uh, when it comes to folks who assert somehow that the county council is out to get the citizens of Montgomery County and restrict Montgomery County and keep Montgomery County strained, uh, restrained from moving forward, that's not the farthest from the case. The reality is, is that what we're trying to do is make sure that we keep all our residents safe. The same thing that we've been doing over the past year and a half, almost two years. That's what we've done. We've kept residents safe here in Montgomery County, working with our public health officer, working with all of our Department of Health and Human Services, and working with the greater community. I want to give the community credit because you as individuals did what you needed to as well. You listened you to, to the public health orders. Uh, you listened to the science that was out there, and you tried to do the same things as well. And this isn't perfect. Uh, let me just be very clear. No one is. Uh, regardless of what side you're on, uh, in terms of whether you want to have masks or don't, no one has crystal ball and knows what tomorrow holds. And you heard from Dr. Bridgers talking about the multitude of variants that continue to be out there. And sure, there are things that we need to pay attention to, but there are also things that we're not going to let stand in the way of us in our recovery. We are in a recovery mode. And so I do think that this is the next step in that iteration. I will say this, uh, uh, Councilmember Friedson and I also had a chance to talk this weekend and talked about um, uh, some sort of date certain. I do believe uh, that we need to talk about when this ends tied to our vaccination rates and how we get folks vaccinated. We understand and we'll be talking with our Montgomery County Public School partners in a little bit about our youngest children, our 5 to 11 sector who have yet to be vaccinated. Let's be cautious in understanding of that as well and the risk that is posed. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that before we speed out of that tunnel, now that we see the light, uh, that we've got our seatbelts on. And this is what we need to do to make that happen. Let's make sure we strap in. Let's make sure that we're safe. Let's have something that's a moderate way of us getting out. And then when we achieve that vaccination rate that we know amongst all of our cohorts, then we can talk about sunsetting this uh, mass mandate and moving forward. So for those who ask what the goal is, for those who quote the article in the Atlantic about have we lost sight, we haven't lost sight. In fact, I know very clearly what I'm looking at, which is making sure that all of our residents in Montgomery County can be safe uh, and protected. And from my standpoint, as a member of the Board of Health, that means increasing our vaccinations for those who have yet to be vaccinated, as well as some of those cohorts that still are out there, uh, and at the same time, making sure that we have a reasonable ramp up and ramp off time uh, so that we can ensure we eliminate those ups and down blips that we will see from time to time based on different sorts of circumstances. So uh, I really just want to close by again thanking Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Stoddard, all of our health and human services, and our public health teams for all the work that they've done before and they've done leading up to today to help get us prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Jawando. Thank you. Uh, good morning. And thanks as always, Dr. Bridges, Dr. Stoddard, and your teams for all your work. Uh, appreciate the discussion. I know we'll get into more of the specifics and take actual vote later. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, it's fortuitous I went after Council Member Rice because, we, you know, he and I have been in similar place on this for, I think, throughout this conversation and this unprecedented event of 
of as is has has the whole council of wanting to be cautious and follow the science. Um, you know, the five to eleven year old uh, vaccination. You know, we're we're imminent. We're on the doorstep, um, and so we have this confluence of events where there's moderate trend. You know, the substantial transmission. We we've, we've triggered uh, that, and we're trying to decide. Okay, well, what are we going to do? I've said this in the previous events. We also have, it's almost like deja vu. We also have Thanksgiving, right? We also have holiday season. Uh, we just had Halloween. Uh, and some of you saw my, the Jawando's 70 show. And thank you for the comments of the colleagues. So, and, and while it was all great and we had a good time and we socially distanced and we, we knocked doors for the first time in a couple of years, uh, I am concerned that, uh, you know, as the father of four children under 11, uh, one of whom is in her second quarantine right now because of a classmate contracting COVID, uh, that the confluence of events that I want to hear from you, Dr. Bridges in particular, and Dr. Stoddard, if he has comments, isn't it, wouldn't it just be prudent to keep a shorter, you know, to keep the mask, uh, mask, indoor masks on until we get through the, you know, get our kids vaccinated uh, you know, get through the holiday season, or at least have a shorter uh, off ramp time. Um, you know, when it when it is triggered. I think leading up, you want to have those cases until the, the, we've had we've, we've gone through the part where the mass mandate will be rescinded based on our previous action. Um, but to wait seven to ten days to put it back in place, and if you get one blip day, the clock starts over. It, it almost seems like you, you know, you're, you're waiting until you get completely, you step out into a storm and you wait till you're completely drenched to change your clothes. So can, can you just talk to me about the rationale based on, on your science uh, and what you, what your read of the science is and what would be most prudent? Sure. Good, good morning, council member Jawando, and thank you for that. So for the past five or six days, I've had extensive conversations with other experts in the field. We've talked to our public health advisory committee, and I actually posed that question. Our epidemiology team uh, and, and our county stat team did some preliminary analysis where we looked at an on-ramp and an off-ramp. We looked at seven days. We looked at uh, 10 days. We looked at 14 days, and we looked at 20 days, and through that analysis, we saw that the symmetry would come in a uh, seven day on and a seven day off ramp because we know that the virus fluctuates. And so that was the rationale for that. They all agreed that, you know, that it's better to have um, an equal number of days on and an equal number of days off so that we can monitor the data. We know that the data changes. We know that the case counts. We know that we have a low positivity rate, et cetera. But we have historically used CDC's data as a measure. CDC provides a broader snapshot and it has a wider net of uh, data access, if you will. Uh, if you note that when I receive the, uh, or our team receives, because it's not principally about me, it's about a, a, a community of practice, if you will. All of us are looking at the data. All of us are looking at those points that will make Montgomery County a safe place for not only ourselves, but for our children. We notice that uh, that there is a lag in data. And so I sent forth the notification as a warning, if you will, that we are moving into a category. And so as we continue to teeter on the cusp of substantial and moderate transmission, I strongly encourage you as a parent and others to continue to model, model that behavior. We know that we have those unvaccinated children who are five to 11 year olds. And we know that those vaccinated folks in some settings may or may not be able to wear a mask. But if we wear a mask indoors, we know that they are more prone to model that behavior based on those that they uh, um, respect and those that are teaching them. And so for those instances, a mask mandate, um, uh, is is a measured, a layered approach. But it's just not only wearing a mask, it's washing our hands, it's maintaining those physical distancing uh, when we are uh, uh, not in contact with individuals who are outside our households. We made significant strides over the past 20 months. Some maybe uh, uh, may feel that it may have been overly conservative and some may feel that it is too liberal and some may be just moderate in their in their rationale, but whatever our public health team and 
whatever our research and uh, development team has done has been in the best interest of Montgomery County, looking at the community uh, as as a whole and not any one uh, particular piece. As we looked at building equity frameworks, as we looked at being transparent in our access, and as we continue to address the need or lack of demand coming down the pike for our pediatric vaccinations, and we hope to administer this weekend. Now, I hope that answers your question, but that's pretty much the rationale that we have put into uh, over the past couple of days and looking at all of the proverbial data points, hospitalizations, deaths, um, you know, case counts, test positivity, reproduction value, and all of them seem to be going back and forth. And I think that amendment would be the best way forward, which would minimize some of that back and forth, but also keep us in a safe space. As you indicated, as we get through, we've gotten through the Halloween, you know, we had, I think, 53 cases a day and maybe 54 cases yesterday. We know traditionally uh, during the middle of the week, that's when we see those data points come in where they may be higher case counts, but we are trending in the um, uh, uh, correct direction. We continue to be, the community continues to be vigilant and adheres to the science and the data as reported. And I think all of these measures, and we get through this last cohort of our five to 11 year olds, that will help uh, uh, get us closer to a uh, more stabilized uh, state as opposed to that. The other key important, you know, flu season. We need folks to get, get their flu shots. You know, last year when folks were wearing masks, you know, we didn't see the number of uh, flu-like uh, individuals presenting in our emergency department. And we've looked at that data as well. We looked at that data as far as those respiratory illnesses that occur typically when there are seasonal changes, when it's cold. And we didn't uh, see that in our pediatric cases. And we can attribute some of that to folks wearing masks, especially our younger generation and our younger population, those school age kids. And so that's kind of where we are. That's the rationale that I present before council. And if there are any additional information, I will provide council accordingly. I appreciate it. Um, Dr. Stout, did you have anything to add or if not, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, as generally speaking, a shorter um, reinitiation is safer. I think the concern that you know, the only concern really about the seven days per se is that, you know, we also, we, well, we have seven days to, to trigger, but then there's also a notice period that we have to provide to business and residents, which ultimately ends up meaning it's a 10 plus day process. And we have had instances where we've had rapid ramp up of cases. And so and we've been discussed internally and, and obviously um, this is Dr. Bridger's call as the health officer about beginning to notice earlier in that seven day period so that it can initiate as close to seven days as On possible. Day. Yeah. Right. It's, as opposed to having to give that, you know, 10 plus days of lead time. And, and the only reason I bring that up is because we have had some periods during this pandemic where we had a very wrap up, very rapid ramp up of cases and um, 10 days of unfettered ramp up could could be problematic. Now, in the situation we're currently in, I want to speak very specifically about it's very possible that, you know, we have a day, I think, coming up, not tomorrow, but the following day where the seven day previous was a day of 108. So we, if we have a day in the 60s that day, we very well could drop to moderate before this is re reactivated. So I'm not necessarily speaking specifically about this period of reactivation because we've been teetering on the line all week. And so it's possible that we would drop below and not reinitiate mass at all. But I think the point, what, what I was trying to do is, because it's going to stay in place between now and December, if we see a period of rapid ramp up, 10 days could be quite long for for that to be allowed to continue with no intervention right. at all. And so yeah. I think that's the what we're discussing is what the latitude offered by this current order as drafted and potentially amended would be to begin that noticing process, let's say on day four, with the initiation occurring closer to day seven than starting the noticing process on day seven and having to wait till day 10 or 11. Yeah, that that's that seems to make a lot of sense. Um, what well, we can obviously discuss this more later. Um, and you know, since we have lagging indicators, we had Halloween. You know, we're gonna we're we're gonna see that in you know, I guess in the middle of this week or soon. Um, and I appreciate your point, Doctor Bridgers, about modeling the good behavior and continuing to wear. You know, if you go to any site, they're gonna say continuing continue CDC, Cleveland Clinic. You know, they. Even if you're vaccinated, you're in a in a large group. Wear a mask if you're in. You know that the guidance is still the guidance. We know it works, um, and I think that's an important point to uh, underscore as well as the flu shots. All right, this is helpful. I appreciate it. And uh, again, as always, there's no 
I know this is difficult. We're in unprecedented times, but thank you for the responses uh, to the questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Reamer. Thanks so much. I'm having poor connection here in my office, so please let me know if for some reason I'm cutting out and you can't really actually hear what I'm saying. Um, I definitely think we are in the last phase of our major effort here, as, as has been said, getting the 5 to 11s vaccinated. We're so close, you know, we're just weeks away from achieving a high level of vaccination, and it will obviously take, I don't know, a couple months maybe to max out, but uh, we're in the final push here. Um, and we've got to keep our eyes on the ball. So generally, I am comfortable with continuing to be cautious and to hold on and, you know, let our 5 to 11s get vaccinated. They are a source of spread, if not also a source of, you know, illness for themselves. Um, I've got a 10-year-old. He's home this week on quarantine. Um, he did not he has not tested positive yet. I don't know that he will, but um, so uh, I'm looking forward to getting him vaccinated. I will say that. And, um, you know, once we are able to vaccinate that population, we will have taken maximum effort to vaccinate our population. And then we can really start to think about how we are going to live with this. And it seems possible that absent some mutation in the virus, you know, we're looking at a, you know, it could be with us for a generation as a deadly virus, but one that is manageable with vaccinations and certain other precautions. I don't know what those certain other precautions will be. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I was not in a rush to see this mask mandate lifted. Uh, I supported a 14-day period last time. I think that would have prevented this from happening. Um, but I also am not really keen on this idea of an automatic trigger policy. You know, I think we're finding that it, it creates challenges for us. And I think we know that we can move quickly when we need to. I mean, we learned about this last week, and here we are today voting on a policy. So, you know, I think we should proceed with our action today, but let's all just consider, you know, that we don't need to adopt, we don't need to persist with a automatic policy that we can hear from our health officer and respond as necessary. And to Dr. Stoddard's point that what if there was a rapid spike, you know, I don't know at what level yet I would say we want to return to masking indoors, you know, once we get the youngest vaccinated. I, I haven't really had a chance to think that through, um, but that's coming, you know, like in December, that'll be here. We'll have hopefully a large share of the youngest vaccinated and there will be, you know, an opportunity to ease up a bit. And, um, but I don't know what that, I don't know what that will be. And I would like to be able to consider that in due course. And, um, so again, again, in a very general way, I think, I don't think we should continue with the automatic triggering policy because it isn't necessary and we are nimble enough. We are quick enough that we can take action as we see a need to. Um, and I don't know that this case trigger is the right trigger anyway. Um, so, you know, I think we ought to consider what it is that we will want once the youngest are vaccinated. What is it that we will want to have in place to then institute a masking requirement? Um, and so, you know, that's that's something we'll just have to think through as we go. But uh, I'm, I'm glad we're taking this action today. Um, I, you know, we're, we're trying to be responsive to the circumstances. It, it seems like cases have trended better again. Perhaps there was, you know, it's, it's not impossible that there was some data dump from a lab that wasn't processing its cases and got a couple of days of a backlog or something and then pushed us over for a few days. I mean, we don't really know exactly why cases spiked for a few days. Um, but uh, in any event, um, 
thanks to everyone's effort uh, on the ordinance. We are weeks away from having our youngest vac you know, getting vaccinated at large numbers. We're almost there. Let's keep focused on that. And then we can really think hard about what it's going to be like to live with this when we're all vaccinated or almost everyone's vaccinated ongoing. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Glass. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so uh, I'm supportive of this uh, Board of Health regulation, the update, and, and we'll get into that later this afternoon. Uh, but we, we all know that the reality is there are going to be people in our community who continue wearing masks regardless of what we decide today. And I understand that and absolutely respect that. And that is, it is their right to protect themselves and their family members and uh, their neighbors and, and coworkers as well. Uh, and what we're just trying to figure out is how do we move forward, recognizing the tremendous work and nation leading work that we have done and accomplished here in Montgomery County. Um, and so scrolling through all of my different feeds and social media over the last few days, there are folks who are looking at our dashboard and recognizing all the different metrics. And because we are all committed to following the metrics and the science and the data, um, I, I want to ask Dr. Stoddart and Bridgers, uh, what, at this point in time, what are the best metrics to look at? Because we're looking at case count, but others are saying look at hospitalization rates, uh, which are uh, an incredibly good indicator of our general well-being, but I know it's a lagging indicator as well. So can you just bring us all up to speed as to which metrics we should be looking at and, and in, in your professional estimate, uh, what, which ones we should be putting more weight behind? Sure, I'll start. We know that there's no absolute metrics to look at when it comes to COVID. We've seen our hospitalization rates spike. We've seen our death rates, unfortunately, spike. We've seen our test positivity go high as almost 5%, which means that, um, that there is a lot of uh, uh, community-level transmissions. We started with low testing volume, and uh, we, we, we increased that, and now we're testing um, about 5,000 folks a week. Thanks again to Montgomery County for wanting to know their status and to be uh, into quarantine and isolate, which we know lead to um, community level transmission. Looking at our CDC data that we have used over the past 20 uh, months going into our 21st month, we've used our case count because we know that our case count indicates that those individuals who have, who have tested Although we're testing more, we are identifying more folks in a population of a million plus individuals. Our case counts have gone um, as high as, as as 200, and now we're looking at uh, 58 today. And so, uh, Dr. Stoddard and I have con have conversations and continue to have conversations about those points that we look at now as we plan and prepare to vaccinate our five to 11 year olds and what they will look like as we recover and look at a endemic state. What do those hospitalization numbers look like? What are those uh, ICU beds and those acute care beds? Are they in fact related to COVID or are they related to other chronic illnesses? We know that our immunocompromised individuals are at risk and are at greater risk. We also know that they're you know, homebound individuals who we contend to vaccinate. And we know that there's a small percentage of our school age kids who are at home due to chronic illnesses and being immunocompromised. And so we look at all these variables to try to determine the best fit for the community. And there is no one best fit right now, Council Member Glass. We look at all of them. We use the case rate and we use the test positivity. We look at the case rate because the case rate is, is an indicator that we have a lot of folks who may be positive, who are maybe asymptomatic, but have tested positive. And so we will continue to look at those data variables. But to answer your question, as we look at all those variables, including our community characteristics, where those populations that we have, we know that there may, uh, that initially when we start uh, vac our vaccination strategies, vaccines were not equitably uh, uh, available to folks little access. And so we created a, a equitable framework and we've used that based on our lessons learned 
from over the past 20 months, where we know those shots should be and at risk. And so we continue to look at the best strategy per cohort. We know that early on we had individuals who were 65 plus and in assisted living facilities and uh, congregate living spaces and developmental disability uh, uh, areas that didn't have access. And so we put shots in those arms. And so when you think about looking at the data and the metrics, there isn't a one fit, uh, best fit all. We need to look at the community as a whole and where those strategic measures, those metrics are applicable. Dr. Star. Yeah, I, so I'm glad Councilmember Rice mentioned the Atlantic article, and I, I certainly don't agree with all of the find, the conclusions drawn by the Atlantic article about having lost their way. I do think that the the there's a few things about the article that I did find uh, thought provoking, and they and I would encourage all the council members to read it because I think it is sort of the next conversation that we're going to have, and that is where we're going with this. And one of the other things in the article that I definitely agree with is that with each day and each vaccination, the count, case counting becomes less and less useful. And we're going to reach a phase where it is, you know, counting cases is not, it is really not the way to measure the way this, um, how we're going to continue to continue to respond to an endemic disease. Um, and, and what I mean by that is the consequences of infections for those who are vaccinated are vastly different from those who are unvaccinated. And as we have more vaccinated people, more vaccinated populations, we have to factor that into how we decide to respond now. As we saw with uh, former Secretary of State Colin Powell, as, as uh, uh, Mr. Bridger, or Dr. Bridgers already alluded to, um, there are still if those in our members of our community that we have to protect, even with vaccination on the table. And so I think that's an incredibly important thing for us to consider. The other thing I would really point to, the other metric that is really important, as you noted, is hospitalization. We had a very robust conversation as the Joint Public Safety and HHS Committee yesterday. Uh, I would encourage members of the public to go back and watch that video as well about the status of our hospitals. And I think the hospitals were very uh, articulate about the impacts they have seen from COVID, but also other things. We've done great harm to our healthcare system generally by this pandemic because A, staffing has been greatly reduced. Uh, people went untreated with some of their underlying conditions and those are you know, presenting with much more substantial illness at this point, increases in mental health issues and things of that nature. And so our buffer for how we respond to spikes is less than it was when this pandemic started. The healthcare system is just not in as good a condition as it was before the pandemic. And so um, when we look at our, our bars on our hospitalization numbers, the COVID hospitalization rate remains relatively low. I think it's the, at the you know, moderate level right now. And that's a good thing. But recognizing that we do not have a ton of excess capacity in our healthcare system because of everything that we've done to harm the system over the last 21 months um, it, it get, should give us pause about how we assess even the hospital numbers moving forward. And so I do think case counts are become less meaningful. There'll be a lot less meaningful after we vaccinate a large number of five to 11 year olds and hospitalization numbers will be important. But again, even a low level of hospitalization should be viewed under the, the lens of where our hospital systems are, healthcare systems are already. Uh, th th thank you both for that. And uh, Dr. Starden, I'm glad you uh, re-upped yesterday's good conversation with the HHS and Public Safety Committee about the hospitals. Uh, definitely required viewing for those who want a deeper dive into how this has affected our healthcare system. And I appreciate Chairs Albernaz and Katz for, for holding that conversation. And with regard to the Atlantic article, which I too have read, the, the takeaway, and I think really the, the, the important point was made by the Harvard professor, Joseph Allen, who said, quote, we need to define a level of risk we can live with. And that is the conversation that we're having, right? And we, for the last 18 months, have decided that we're going to make those decisions based on the science and the data. And, you know, again, previewing a conversation I know we're going to have later this afternoon, but I, I will just say at this point that I, I do have some concerns about setting a date for the termination uh, of at, at this point in time, because either we're basing our decisions on the science and the data, or we aren't. And if we're setting a date from this point out, then we're not basing it on the science or data. I would rather base all future decisions on these conversations and on the benchmarks and on the portals. Uh, and then we will determine at that point what the level of risk we believe our community can tackle. Uh, and so again, conversation for, for later this afternoon, but appreciate you 
both level setting with us, uh, the, uh, the confluence of data and trying to sort through it all because it is all important. Uh, and we have incredibly smart residents and constituents here um, who are helping guide us, uh, but it is complicated. Um, and so uh, we'll continue this conversation this afternoon, but thank you. Thank you very much for this update. And Councilmember Glass, I know the previous health, health officer always or continuously uh, uh, level set. Um, I like to keep us all on the same page. Very good. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Nevado. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Stoddard. I also want to thank our, our constituents, uh, you know, those who have communicated with us uh, and those who don't communicate with us, but obviously have been very mindful of uh, making sure that we keep each other safe through this extraordinary experience. And I have to say, you know, this is both, it's both a personal and a collective conversation. And I believe this is why it is so difficult to talk about one size fits all. Uh, and early on in the pandemic, I remember, you know, thinking about how none of us got a manual for how to navigate a pandemic of the sort and how it was so much easier to close everything down or to, you know, impose all of these mandates, but then trying to open up gradually or trying to figure out how we would, you know, start easing some of the restrictions. It's, 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 a, it's a task because of what we just heard. This is a very, you know, um, unpredictable virus. But I think that the proof is in the pudding. I think that, you know, the fact that we have led in the way that we have led with a county of a million point one people, a very diverse county with all of the languages that are spoken with different socioeconomic, um, you know, uh, constituents with different socioeconomic uh, statuses, et cetera, all of that taken into consideration overall, the totality, in my opinion, has shown that we have worked very closely with our constituents and made decisions that have been uh, really, truly important in terms of the results. So I, I think this is an important moment to, to, you know, revisit, to figure out where we are. I would agree that setting, you know, these dates, et cetera, works against precisely what we're, we just said, that this is in many ways something that we have to continually reassess uh, with this milestone coming up. And so when we talk about assessing how much risk we want to take, we do have to remember that there are many in our community who don't necessarily engage or who don't have, you know, the luxury of access to quality health care, who have been disproportionately affected by a lot of disparities, who have other, you know, major barriers um, that, that we have a responsibility to ensure that writ large we are take, making decisions that are in the best interest of all of our residents. And so, so I think it is, it's important to, to note that, yes, we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we will continue to look at the science, listen to, you know, the CDC and our, you know, uh, experts, uh, and we will always do whatever is in our best interest. None of us, you know, enjoyed having to stay at home, having to, you know, go grocery shopping and coming home and trying to disinfect all the, the food. And, you know, it's been it's been a process, but we're very close. And um, and so I think that we can strike a balance here. And I, I do look forward to our conversation later on. But really do want to, again, thank our um, Dr. Bridgers, Dr. Stoddard, everyone, my colleagues, and all of our residents for having gotten us to this point. Uh, it is quite an accomplishment and um, and we will keep working, you know, with each other. But just know that this is, I, I know there have been some stuff on social media, you know, and, and, and a lot of insults and threats and things like that about our intentions. Um, again, the proof is in the pudding. And I think what we have seen in terms of our leadership on a national level has shown that all of us do this from a personal perspective, right, as, a, as parents and, and as people who also are affected by this virus, we're not immune to it, but also our responsibility as leaders to make sure that the collective health and safety of our residents is, is, is number one. So thank you. 
Well said. Yes, we're not just managing our the risk to us and everybody who writes in. It's the risk to everyone else that shares a grocery store with us um, who might fall into the same category as Colin Powell. Um, Council Vice President Albernoz. Thanks, Mr. President. I really, really appreciate the thoughtful comments mm -hmm. in this discussion, which just continues the trend since we've had from a year and a half ago the very thoughtful deliberation all of us have taken uh, to get us where we are today, which is in a much better place. And I really appreciate it, Councilmember Jawando's metaphor of not wanting to go outside, you know, and, and wait till you're drenched. But the good news is it's only been a drizzle uh, for, for quite some time now. And that's, you know, frankly, because of all of the efforts that everyone has discussed. I'll just remind everyone, too, when we enacted this legislation earlier this summer, um, we were one of the first jurisdictions to tie it to a specific metric um, of, of community spread, in part because we kept having to meet week after week and make decisions. And we heard from the community regarding the need for predictability, regarding the need to uh, be able to establish something that people could focus on and count on. And so uh, I, I think, you know, could we have looked at the off-ramp as well as the on-ramp? Sure. But we were not in the same place with vaccination rates as we are now. And we've also had several months now of just a drizzle, uh, which is really great news, which is why it's appropriate for us in order to stay consistent and in order to enter this, this next phase of where we are in the fight against this pandemic and this virus, um, because of all the steps we've taken, we're in a much better place. And we're in among the best places across the country and really, frankly, the world when you consider uh, a jurisdiction of our size. So I think it's more than appropriate for us to stay consistent. And I do just want to say publicly, as I said during our press conference yesterday, Dr. Bridgers, uh, you were immensely responsive over these last four days. Uh, all of us, when we saw the email come through that there was a chance we were going to have to rescind a mask order that we had just enacted, we were like, oh, here we go again. Uh, and so it was uh, a good opportunity for us to meet this moment and to address it in real time, as we have so many times before, uh, and make the adjustments necessary as we will later this afternoon. Now, with regards to the sunset, I very much appreciate the comments of my colleague, Councilmember Andrew Fritz, and I certainly understand where he's coming from. He and I have had many conversations this weekend as well, and um, I, I am um, open to a sunset. Uh, the date specific, I, I, I believe, still is in question. I, I want to remind everyone of the troubling news that we got last week, that the entire state is only receiving 108,000 vaccinations in the first wave for children between the ages of 5 and 11. There are almost that many just here in Montgomery County alone. And so uh, in my home, we got the notification from our pediatrician just this weekend that between one and 2% of patients eligible in our practice are going to be able to receive the vaccination. And they were encouraging everyone to go through and look at pharmacies and the county and the state. And frankly, it felt like deja vu all over again. And so it's going to take several weeks before even just the first shot gets into all of the arms of our children between five and 11. It then will take a period of time between the first shot and the second shot and then it will take a period of time after that second shot comes to full uh, uh, immunity. Um, so we, we are still talking about a little bit more time here, probably prior to December 31st for a sunset. So I'm looking forward to the discussion this afternoon, again, open to a sunset, but, but I, I, I'm not sure that December 31st is quite the right time frame given those challenges uh, and where we are uh, with uh, with regards to, um, you know, the holiday season, as, as was stated earlier. But I, but I do think we need to signal to the public um, that we, we are following uh, our public health recommendations, and Dr. Bridgers has discussed being open to a sunset as well. Um, and I appreciate Dr. Stoddard's comment, comments, uh, which help just sort of underscore that point. So I guess um, I, I look forward to the action that we're taking regarding the seven days on and off and, and just reminding the public that, you know, we are going to continue to meet as necessary and as information is available. Uh, and, and let's hope and pray there isn't another variable uh, variant similar to 
uh, the Delta variant, uh, but we have to have our eyes wide open and acknowledge that that's possible. Um, so I look forward to um, the ongoing discussion uh, and, and I appreciate your continued leadership here, Dr. Bridgers. Um, I asked all of my questions this weekend and you answered them in your opening comments and in responses to other colleagues. So I don't have any other additional questions at this moment, um, but I do look forward to the discussion this afternoon. And with that, I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Vice President. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and obviously I'm, I'm one who tries not to repeat what has already been said, uh, but I did wanna uh, repeat thank, thank yous to Dr. Bridgers and Dr. Stoddard for all that you do, not just on this issue, on on today's issue, but but uh, throughout this this crisis. And I and I agree that we've had great thoughtful comments. And and I'm um, I'm one who believes that the suggestion and 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 I am open to the sunset suggestion, although I don't know that that we need to do that today. Uh, there again, that'll be a conversation for this afternoon. But when we first started and, and we said, look, you know, we've gone from substantial to moderate and it took us seven days to get there and only one day to get back, it reminded me of the price of gasoline. Because you know what happens with gasoline is when the price goes up, the, the gas stations say, well, we're going to raise their price right now because when we replace this, we're going to have to, we're going to have to spend more. But if the price goes down, they say, well, we're going to have to wait because we paid more for the gas that's already in the ground. And so for us to say it takes seven days to take it off and one day to go back on made no sense to me. And, and, and there again, you can have a, a spike in number, a spike in numbers. You can have all of these, uh, types of, of, uh, things that happen. And I think the seven days on and seven days off. And to Dr. Stoddard's point that the fact that we have to notify, but if there is something that is an absolute for the extra three days to notify, but if there's something that's an absolute emergency, then I believe that we need to come back because it's an absolute emergency and have those discussions right then. This, but at this point, I think we are heading in the right direction, I think, and, and even for the the substantial numbers that we're reaching, the substantial numbers are way down from the, on the on the scale. I mean, you know, it goes from what uh, Dr. Bridgers from 50 to 99, uh, 99 where, well, thank goodness we're still in the 50 range. So even, even if it's, it, 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 in some cases, these are arbitrary numbers. And so therefore, we're uh, substantial, but it's really the, the higher end of, of moderate or the lower end of substantial, and we're near near the moderate side. So I'm comfortable doing that. I do believe that we do have to have the conversation of whether or not we are wise to have a sunset or whether or not we should have the discussions when the sunset should actually take place. But other than that, I'm fine. And I appreciate everyone's work on this because of all the things anyone has ever worked on, this is probably the most difficult. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, anyone else want to get in? If not, um, this uh, regulation is introduced, and uh, I think we can recess until 1.30. Mr. President. Oh, Councilmember Jawanda. Uh, I just wanted to uh, be in the affirmative for the consent calendar, I think. I oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, why don't we go back? Uh, council member, uh, Madam, Madam Clerk, Council member, if I remember right, Katz had moved and uh, right, Rice had seconded the consent calendar. All those in favor? Could I be? Oh, yeah. Great. Great. That is everybody this time. Thank you. This morning was a little unpredictable. It's good to be ahead of schedule. Okay. I think we are uh, able to recess until 1.30. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dr. Stoddard. Thanks, Dr. Bridgers. Stay safe.